Um, thank you all for coming tonight. It really means so much to me and to all the artists uh, tonight to have you here. And uh, I really wanna thank the Los Angeles Center for Ho Photography for hosting these monthly talks of the 12 artists who are part of the Memory is a Verb, Exploring Time and Transience exhibition. So this <clears throat> exhibition grew out of a year long masterclass that began in January, 2021, which already seems like a million years ago. And now it has continued for an additional four months as we continue with our artist talks. And I think the group will continue as a collective for a long time. Um, everyone is very bonded. Um, the idea for this class was not only to bring projects to completion, but to also elevate all parts of their photographic journey their work, their articulation, their writing, and most importantly, the way they think about them, their projects and themselves as artists. I am so lucky to call them friends, which I'm gonna get choked up. Uh, and I'm constantly inspired by their creativity and intelligence. This is an exceptional group of women, all exploring the liminal space between time and transience. Represented in this exhibition are the universal concepts of loss, mortality, and legacy, and the exploration of what inspires us to seek solace and re-examine our histories, subsequently unearthing discoveries about ourselves, our relationships, and our place in the universe. And I just have to say, thank God for photography. It has given us a language to discuss all of these issues. The project Memory is a Verb Exploring Time and Transience began as the world was besieged with fear and anxiety during a pandemic, longing for a return to normalcy. Feeling a sense of loss, we craved connection to our past and to each other. The pandemic also offered a unique moment in which to interpret things differently. Beyond nostalgia, which selectively employs memory as a self-soothing bomb, our exploration reconsidered how we might view the past and what is the purpose and significance in light of our changed circumstances. So I, you can read more, but I don't wanna, uh, I wanna get to the artist talks, but I do wanna share briefly our website. And it's memoryisaverb.com. Uh, all 12 projects are on the website. You can learn about individual artists. So let's look at Susan who is uh, presenting tonight. This is her page and you can read her statement. You can see more of her work. You can read her bio. And um, this is about our talks and contact and we are, looking for exhibition opportunities. So we do hope to have a, a long roster of exhibitions here, but um, I, I think this is such a great example of what community can do, that we put this together. Someone in the group is a website designer. She designed the website. One of the members in the group is a graphic designer. She created our wonderful logo. And everyone helped in some way to create this site and this exhibition. So um, that is so fantastic. Um, so I would like to begin our artist talks and um, I am going to start with the wonderful Diane Hemingway. Um, Diane is an artist who tells stories of life through photography and interdisciplinary media. Her photographic work, which includes written and recorded prose, which you will hear some recording tonight, explores the spiritual, emotional, and physical link between the natural world, memory, and lived experience. 
Hemingway received her BS in business from the University of New Hampshire, Durham. Um, did I get that right? And her MFA from the Maine Media College in Rockport, Maine. She has exhibited nationally, including exhibitions at the Griffin Museum of Photography, the Praxis Gallery, the A. Smith Gallery, and the Midwest Center of Photography for Photography. Hemingway has published two monographs, The Fire in My Throat in 2021 and The Wild Cosmos in 2020, which is a multimedia publication combining image, text, and audio. Her work has also been included in editions published by Nord Photography, curated by the one and only Sig Harvey. She lives and works in Maine. So I wanna say that we are going to have a Q&A with each artist directly after their talks. So if you have a question or a curiosity, please put them in the Q&A section of this uh, webinar and uh, we will get to your questions. So now I would love to introduce the wonderful Diane Hemingway. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. And Hello everybody. I would like to thank you for coming to these talks and to LACP for providing us this amazing opportunity. Aline, thank you for sharing your kind advice, infinite wisdom and gentle encouragement during the past year. And now I have to close our picture. And to the memory of the verb artists, I am both grateful and honored to have shared this time with you. I am Diane Hemingway, a fine art photographer based in Maine. I'd like to take you on a journey to the wild cosmos, my world filled with memory, magic, and meaning. But first, I will begin at my beginning. Time and again, I pinched myself when I recall my untethered childhood. My mom and dad were both teachers and key influences when it came to fostering a joy of discovery in both the natural world and in my art. They were young and not yet out of college when they met. They had five children in the same number of years. We lived in a very old Victorian house filled with noise and love. My earliest memories were, were of making were as a little girl in that house. I was forever picking wildflowers and filling my pockets with shell beans with names like Orca and Appaloosa. Everything was turned into an art project. My mom was an artist and taught me to sew at a very young age and to make sugar flowers using her cake decorating kits. I knitted extremely long scarves and made pinch pots from my backyard clay. For my mom, when fall came, the leaves turned gold and burgundy, never just yellow and red. She couldn't walk by a flower without pinning one in her hair. I loved to make and found my home to be a place filled with comfort and creativity. Rachel Carson's quote from A Sense of Wonder seems to have been written about my parents. If a child is to keep alive her inborn sense of wonder, she needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with her the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. I was lucky to have not just one, but two adults fostering my sense of wonder. An ordinary weekend excursion could be driving the entire family to the woods in search of the elusive lady slipper. We would hunt for hours being told to look but not touch. I remember my older brother secretly telling me that they were so rare I would be arrested for touching one. It just gave me goosebumps to know that something so wild didn't want to be tamed. And each summer our family piled into the suburban along with tents, sleeping bags, backpacks, and our small collection of eight track tapes We'd wind our way across the country from Maine to California while sleeping under the stars. My dad always had a camera in his hand, which later fostered my interest in photography. But time flies, it comes to a halt and it slips away. The road trips ended as I headed off to college with the stern parental advice that I should major in something that would get me a good paying job. Soon after graduation, I began my long software engineering career, followed closely by becoming a mom to three boys. 
I tried to pass my deep-rooted love and appreciation for this magical world onto my sons. It is impossible to navigate life without loss. Even as an adult, nothing prepared me for when the stars, my mom, dad, and brother fell from the sky. Seeking solace, I quit my job and immersed myself in the land and in my art, trusting that my world would right itself. Having spent my childhood fully immersed in the sensory wonders of the natural world, photography became the perfect medium for my art. It allowed me the opportunity to disappear into the land and fully connect with this wild earth. During this time of discovery, I learned of several women photographers who also found inspiration in the natural world. Their work really resonated with me. Rinko Kawuchi's exquisite images are visual poems. They bring a magic to often overlooked everyday things. Barbara Bosworth's images explore the relationship between humans and the natural world, something that has always been important to me. Her attention to the world around us is a reminder to look more closely. When I first opened Rebecca Norris Webb's book, My Dakota, my heart skipped a beat. It was a pivotal moment in the early days of photography for me. Her intensely personal response to her brother's sudden unexpected death struck a tender nerve. I wasn't quite ready to explore the interior language of grief, but it kept finding its way into both my photographs and my daily writing. Here is some of my earlier work. My photographs were metaphors. They contained unexplained mystical happenings and revealed hidden symbols or imagined messages. I looked for beauty in what was left behind. Photography already had a hold on me, but I was hungry for more. I enrolled in Maine Media College's MFA program to continue charting my own path with my art. Most important to me was working to understand the ever-present conversation between my inner and outer world. The Wild Cosmos is the culmination of my MFA program and is the project included in the Memory as a Verb Collective. Time, impermanence, and the sensuous world are tightly woven throughout this work. During the years of its making, I retraced the cross-country trips of my youth and explored the back roads of Maine. I wanted to rekindle the wonder of my untethered childhood while remembering those I had lost. Writing is an important part of my practice. My mind is a tangle of thoughts and memories and journaling is my way to make sense of them. I believe that my writing and my photography are intertwined, each informs the other. I group the images in the wild cosmos into chapters for my experiences. Wonder, whimsy, loss, and the mystical. I pair my photographs with audio versions of my writing loosely based on my journal of field notes and dreams. I made the decision to record my prose pieces because I liked the idea of intertwining the senses of sight with sounds so that they shape one another. I'll be showing you images and playing audio when I take you on this journey to the wild cosmos. Chapter one, wonder is an elusive songbird. I used to take dandelions from the lawn with a spoon. It was a chore assigned by my dad. He thought they were weeds. A full bag could be traded in for a popsicle, but sometimes I couldn't part with my bag. I was under the spell of yellow. I was sure I could feel the tremble of goldfinch wings or 100 exploding sunsets or an endless supply of butterscotch candy wrapped in gold and cellophane. I clung tight to the wildness of the dandelion. I preferred possibility to popsicles. I 
I open the back door that overlooks the field and place a large dog bed outside. It is for my spirit animal to come while I sleep. I leave the door wide open that night. In the morning, I find a black deer glistening in the bed. She has a soft velvet coat and long blonde hair. Her eyes are like blue glass, almost hidden by her lashes. When she sees me, she gets up slowly, bats her eyes, flips her Rapunzel hair, and bows. I believe in everything. Chapter two, loss is a rugged thunderstorm. I am alone at Mount Rushmore, looking at the president. Workers are adding a new face to the memorial, but they haven't yet revealed who. A park ranger steps into the crowd and yells that World War III has been declared. For a minute, it is silent. Then screams rise skyward as everyone begins running toward their cars. Racing through the parking lot, I notice every car is filled with wild animals. It reminds me of phone booth stuffing back when that was a craze. The animals have their faces and bottoms smooshed flat against the windows. The only empty seat is for the driver. I reach my car and jump in. There's a bear in the passenger seat. I look into his big brown eyes and for a moment, do not breathe. I start the car and the song Wild Horses comes on the radio. I drive on through the prairie trying to sing along. Wild horses always makes me cry. Spring welcomes summer with an outburst of color. The meadow is thick with orange poppies, scarlet flags, black-eyed Susan, baby blue eyes, and my favorite, the wild cosmos. Every color is in bloom, except black. Black is never in bloom. When we were kids, my mother threw away all the black crayons from our Crayola boxes. To my mom, happiness had a color, and it wasn't black. When I had my own children, I learned from my mother that my brother had colored everything a shade of black. He never chose the bright crayons. This had worried her. She believed that getting rid of black would get rid of his darkness. It is black when I close my eyes to remember him. Chapter three, whimsy is a small town curse. I own a Western saloon. My name is Miss Kitty, but I know I'm not the Miss Kitty from television. I stand on the porch just outside the bat wing doors leading inside. If you want to enter, you have to pay me with a shot glass full of rainbow sprinkles. If a customer doesn't have any, I turn them away. If a customer gives me a full glass, they swing open the doors and go in. Alone on the porch, I grin widely and tip my head back to pour the rainbow down my throat. But each time, the sprinkles disappointingly turn into water before ever touching my tongue. I'm not looking for ordinary.
Chapter four, the mystical is the silent drum. I live on an island in the middle of the ocean. My house is surrounded by an orchard of peach trees. I love living there, but the only way to get home is a single lane road that goes straight into the ocean. At the beginning of the road is a magic eight ball in an old phone booth. Only the magic eight ball knows when the waves will wash over the road, making it impassable. I ask and turn it over to reveal, concentrate, and ask again. I have been here for days. I'm trying to stay calm. I am traveling at night using the stars for navigation. Whenever I want, I can fly up past the stars into the heavens. All I have to do is flap my arms. I do this over and over again. Each time my head pops up into a white stillness filled with whispers. The air is warm and sweet, almost sticky. I'm looking for you, straining to hear your voice in the emptiness. I never find you. Sometimes it is enough to know that you were there. Nature is my portal to survival. Much like the transcendentalists, I believe it is essential to experience the simplicity and solitude of nature to better understand oneself. I emerged resilient like the wild cosmos, a wildflower that can thrive in almost any circumstance. Both my photography and my recorded prose are love letters to places, memories, dreams, and family. Each is an invitation to pay attention. In closing, I will share two bits of wisdom that guided me during the making of the wild cosmos. There is nothing you can see that is not a flower. There is nothing you can think that is not the moon, Basho. And therefore, all poems are elegies, George Barker. Thank you all for coming and it was a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Thank you so much, Diane, that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I hope there are some questions, please put them in the Q&A, um, but I will start off. Uh, it's so, fantastic to hear the prose and, and I agree with you in some ways it's it's because I love the movies to hear someone talking rather than having to read it and, and apply it to the image it made it so powerful so I was curious if you um, think about the storytelling before or after you take the photograph um that's a, that's a really good question. Sometimes it happens right during um, a photograph. I'll remember an incident, like a story about my brother or something will remind me of him, but a lot of them are dream prompts. I dream like crazy, awesome dreams. So I just, I write them down um, when I wake up and I use those and kind of um, start from there. So, um, so it happens both, you know, both in the middle of the night and middle of the day. And there seemed to be a, a number of references to animals, which I loved, um, especially the spirit animal. Um, and uh, where you live in Maine, are there lots of, is there a lot of wildlife? Um, what we live on a little piece, of, what we have like six acres, it's not a little piece um, LA wise, but it's pretty little for Maine. And we, we, you know, we have tons of deer and coyotes and fox and things like that. And um, yeah, so we have, we have a lot of animals and running around the yard. So Karma is asking, I love the way the words go with the photo. Do you think yourself more as a photographer or as a poet? And what is your training and background? In, in writing 
Um, you mean in, in, in my art, photography pretty much was um, learned as an adult. You know, I went and then I went back to get my MFA just because I really wanted to um, focus on it. But for writing, no, I had no training at all. I just kind of started writing when I was in my MFA program and um, really spent a lot of time doing doing that. Was there another part of the question that I missed? No, nope, that was it. Um, yeah. Amy asks, this was beyond stunning. Thank you, Diane. Um, and I have to say, Amy is starting the MFA main media um, oh, cool. program. Um, she asks, do you hear the stories as you were working? Can you hear a voice track? Um, no, I just have, I have a very active imagination. I always, you know, like tonight, even before I came here, I'm like, I'm going to sit in my chair and it's going to chip over and then I'm going to jump up and finish my talk, you know? So my mind is always doing little crazy things like that. So I, I think I, I have journals and journals full of, and I recorded probably, you know, 30 pieces. So that's just a small, small bit of, of, of what I have recorded. You know, one thing I think a lot about is when you're traveling, especially taking a road trip, or mm -hmm. you have a lot of time alone, that mm -hmm. you do hear this inner dialogue, um, where you yeah. don't always hear it when you live in an urban environment, where there's a lot of distraction. But once, I don't know, there's something about that cross country trip where you're like narrating the experience to yourself inside. Oh you yeah, definitely. Um, I think the more time you spend, you know, like I spend a lot of time alone when I make photographs. I try to do it with people, you know, like I'll do a workshop here and there, but then I'm always like out the door and in the woods somewhere. But um, that's kind of how I grew up. No matter how hard I try, I end up where I, you end up where you started, don't you? You know, Absolutely. You can't escape your childhood. <laughs> yeah. um, Hillary asks, uh, can you speak about the process of sequencing your images? Um, well, I use Rinko Kawuchi's book for um, inspiration. I can't remember which one it was that um, it's probably Illuminance. Illuminance. She, the sequencing in that book is just amazing. You can learn yeah. so much just by going back and and seeing what she did and things like that and i sequence on my dining room table i just print them you know two by three and fill the table up and then i start throwing things around and then i make them bigger so it, it's just a matter of moving you know moving images around and, and um things like that um dina asks if you ever imagine the work with written text or as audio um, I tried it with, I tried it with written text and I have really neat penmanship. So it looked really formal beside, you know, it looked like a really formal, bizarre story, you know, so it, it just didn't, it didn't feel right to me. Ideally, I would love to project images and have all of my dreams and, and notes just sequenced, you know, together, you know, so that you can do what you want with it in your own head. You know? um, we have a couple of questions about your process as a writer. Um, Lisa asks, uh, would you share your process of how you composed poetry that complements and expands the imagery? And Jennifer asks, can you talk about your writing practice and how it differs from your photographic practice? Okay, so um, like I like I keep a journal and my writing is usually I just jot down a few things and then I am the slowest writer in the world so it takes me like one of those pieces will take me an entire week to write, you know I just write and write and write and I'm kind of a perfectionist and then I don't tend to photograph and write at the same time. Like I, I tend to step out of photography and then spend time writing and then I'll make some images. And um, it's, it's more just, you know, dreams. And then I 
carry them around in my head. And when I'm out in the woods, sometimes I'll, I'm like, ah, I've got an ending. I've got the, I've got the sentence that I need. So it just, it's, I don't think I'm a natural, <laughs> basically it doesn't, it's like, I'm not prolific, you know? The, the crowd does not agree with you. Um, yeah. And Don asks, uh, how did you find the reader, the person that is reading your, um, your prose? Um, I interviewed a, a whole bunch of people. I went to um, a lot of the websites that you can interview people. And then I had heard certain people. So I, I took, um, I, I gave them a piece or two pieces and asked them to read them and, and give me like a little audition. And I probably did that with at least a dozen people. And I, I was looking for a voice that kind of could be mistaken for my own, you know, and and then I wanted somebody that didn't sound really formal. And I remember like the Miss Kitty piece, I had given it to somebody and she was like, hello, my name's Miss Kitty, you know? And I was like, no, that's definitely not gonna work. So I was looking for no accent and not too cute and just really, um, it took me a while to find somebody and then, um, and then I did. Okay, I'm gonna ask two final questions. Um, let's see, where did it go? Um, Elizabeth asked, were you much of a writer as a child? And if so, what did you write? I kept a, um, a diary that had a lock and a key on it. And then my mom on our cross country trips used to um, make us keep a journal. So we all had to write and mine was, you know, I was sometimes a teenager. It was full of where all the cute guys pumped gas because that was back in the day when they pump gas for you, you know, so my, my journals were not really that deep at the time, but um, I've always written and I've always jotted notes down, you know, everywhere. They're, they're all over my house. Okay, I lied. I have two more questions for you. Okay. Um, oh, Aline. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Tanya asked a really interesting question. Did your understanding or the shape of the Wild Coast cosmos change or evolve during memory as a verb? Um, I don't think it, I don't think it changed. It, it made me more comfortable with it, you know, and it made me really grab onto the transience of, of, um, of life, of nature, of everything, you know, and um, yeah, it, it didn't change. It, it, it made me like my work more, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, sometimes you just have to have time and to live with it for a while and then be proud of what you've done. So yeah, um, and Vincent asks our final questions, uh, do the images come together at the time you view the subject or do they gel upon later or subsequent reflection of your journaling? They come together when, when I make the image and then, but, but some, you know, like I've chose 40 for the, um, the wild cosmos for, for 10 for each chapter, which I didn't, you know, I didn't show all of them, but I have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images that I had to weed through to, um, to come up with 40. And sometimes it was, I was looking for a certain image to, to go with, to go with a piece of writing, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you, Diane. That was wonderful. And you oh, can you. relax and have your wine now. Yeah. Really. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> okay. Um, next up is the wonderful Susan Lapides. And I've known Susan for a long time. And I was so thrilled to have her in this workshop because. I just love her project so much, and um, I'm so excited for her, um, for the future of it. Susan is a photographic art artist who creates time-based projects focusing on adolescence and place. Through her portraits and landscapes, she examines social, cultural, and community issues. 
Lapidus earned her BA in art history from Tufts University and the School of, uh, of the Museum of Fine Arts. She had an extensive career as a professional editorial photographer working on national publications. She photographed President Barack Obama and then the first African-American editor of the Harvard Law Review and Rose Kennedy on her 91st birthday. That must all have been amazing. The most life-changing assignment was meeting her future husband, photographing for People Magazine. And that is a great story that you have to ask Susan sometime about. Uh, Susan exhibits her fine art photography nationally and internationally. The lobster, well, we're not calling it the lobster. What's the title now, Susan? Sea Change. Okay. All right. I'm going to start again. Sea Change will premiere at Sunbury Shores Art Center in Canada in 2022. Um, she's going to have a big show. So I hope you can get up to see it. And that will be in July. Right? Mm -hmm. July into August. Yeah. Um, St. George exhibitions were presented at the Griffin Museum. Uh, in Winchester, Massachusetts, Sunbury Shores, and the St. John's Art Center in Canada. Her awards include the 2019 Critical Mass Finalist and the Beth Block Juried Membership Honoraria from the Houston Center of Photography. Lapidus was invited to participate in Outspoken Extended, an invitational exhibit of nine women photographers. Her photographs are held in permanent corporate and private collections. She lives in Boston, Massachusetts and New Brunswick, Canada. Welcome, Susan. That was great, Eileen. Thank you so much. And thank you to all my friends and family who are here and all of the other people who are friends of the LACP. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, LACP, for hosting Memory is a Verb Artist Talk. This is a wonderful opportunity. This grid is all of the photographs that are included in Sea Change, which I will discuss today. In addition, I will speak about my project, St. George, Ebb and Flow, and my early career as an editorial photographer. This is my mom and dad. They were opposites. My dad was an engineer. He was immensely supportive of my photography career and taught me to problem solve and gave me a passion for the technical side of photography. My mom taught me about art. We went on adventures in New York City to go to MoMA. We went to galleries and we even went to some artist studios in New York City. My mom was a painter. Here is one of them. It's 48 inches square, influenced by color field painters like Joseph Albers, Mark Rothko, and Frank Stella. I loved mom's painting as a kid, and now I marvel at her sense of color and design, wondering about her insp inspiration and her process. I can only guess. Jim, my brother, also got the art bug from mom. He owns the International Poster Gallery selling vintage lithograph posters. I made this portrait of Jim on the ferry going to Ellis Island, not long after he introduced me to photography. He'd invited me to join him while he was doing his homework in the darkroom for a class taught by David Leventhal, then a young graduate student, my life changed immediately. I signed up for a photography class. Here I am letting my camera lead me around the city. I was 18, a month into my first class when I created this photo story about the racetrack. I remember feeling like I was on an assignment for Life Magazine.
I discovered that the world supported my ability to communicate my insights about people and my observations with a camera. It was the beginning of my editorial career. This portrait of Rose Kennedy was published in the commemorative article about her in Life magazine. And here's the photograph of young Barack Obama, who was then the president of the Harvard Law Review. But the really fun part about this is who it was shot for. Trump Shuttle Magazine. Some picture editors I worked with at one magazine would recommend me to um, another magazine as a local photographer in Boston. So I photographed Chris Schlesinger, uh, a celebrity chef and author of Thrill of the Grill for a Ladies Home Journal. Before her first Olympic games in 1992, I photographed Jenny Thompson in her high school pool for Vis-a-Vis -vis magazine. She went on to become the most decorated American female in Olympic history, winning 12 gold medals over four Olympic games. Natali and his prize Kianini is from my long-term project documenting the lives of a farming family outside of Florence, Italy. Uh, this photo was published in a cover story I photographed about oxen for Smithsonian Magazine. This was picked up as a stock photograph. Jump. I worked for Yankee Magazine more than any other publication. For them, I photographed everything, people, landscapes, architecture, and even food. This was for the This New England feature story about Falmouth Mass on Cape Cod. This for, was for Yankee's house for sale feature. My other favorite clients were land trust organization organizations where I learned how to create work that spoke to the nostalgia of children exploring the outdoors. This became integral aspect of my fine art photography projects. By far the most memorable assignment ever was for People Magazine. I met Peter, my future husband, while photographing his parents and their 14 adopted refugees from Cambodia. His glasses are just peering out at me from the back row in this picture. Our adventures together began. We climbed to Annapurna Base Camp in Nepal. A porter carried our backpack filled with a hundred rolls of slide and black and white film, while we carried two cameras, lenses, a Leica, and a light meter, which you can actually see around my neck which is cool, I never noticed that before. Being in Cambodia was intense in 1992 as it was emerging from the genocidal Khmer Rouge regime and was still occupied by the UN troops. I took this photo in Yangshuo, China in 1993. It was a backpacker's destination and a small market village. In 2006, we went back and it had become a Chinese tourist destination. I could barely recognize it. I've always been fascinated with factories and how things are made. This is during the vanilla bean harvest in Sulawesi, Indonesia. I love this setting, the fisherman, his catch, the scale and the cooing baby. Little did I know how much I would photograph and learn about fishing in the future. Nope. Oh. Evening walk, St. George in New Brunswick, Canada. The Bay of Fundy has the highest tides in the world. At high tide, the water laps the seagrass at the top of the beach and exposes the ocean floor six hours later. The population of St. George, 2,800. And there's not even one traffic light. 
Stairway to Heaven. My inspiration for this project was the colorful stories that the older residents shared about the good old days with an abundance of herring weirs, an ancient sustainable method of fishing for herring. Daddy's Lobster Boat. Maggie and Katie watched whales and they watched their dad seining his weir. They listened to many small town conversations on the wharf and in the church. The Fisherman's Daughter. I wanted to show intimate and iconic moments of the maritime experience. What is it like to live so close to the water, to have a deep connection to the natural landscape? feel the tides, and be mesmerized by the majestic beauty of the continually shifting sea. 40th Annual Clam Bake. Friends and family gather. The party moves inside to play music as the tide rushes in and envelops any trace of the gathering. Don't forget your shoes because you'll never see them again. Jumping salmon. On the wharf in the village of Back Bay, there once stood a sardine canning factory. All of the residents worked in this industry. Today, the factory is gone and the wharf is filled with barges for the farm raised salmon, lobster, seaweed, and sea urchin industries. This was taken inside the salmon hatchery. Warwick. Before I went to New Brunswick, I thought of scuba diving as a colorful undersea exploration, but as a job, it's tough. Harvesting sea urchins, repairing nets, repairing boats. Warwick is relaxing after taking off his heavy tank and regulator. Rock weeder, the grab fork on the wharf 20 feet above is the only way to unload the skiff filled with seaweed. In this series, I wanted to offer a close look at the town's people reliance on nature as a food source and the development of industries that have indelibly shaped the province. Galaxy, this was a rare bloom of the white cross jellyfish. Maggie, the summer sun sets at 11 p.m. So kids stay up late to be outdoors and make s'mores. Leap, jumping 43 feet off a bridge is fun for some people. Feel of my heritage and love storytelling. She had 11 siblings and everyone in Back Bay was related at that time. With the big kids watching out for the younger ones, they roamed the streets, fields and rocky coast in the very spot where her family had landed many, many, many generations ago. Sea View Full Gospel Church. Two things are constant in Back Bay, church and fog. Sisters, a New Brunswick cur curator saw this photo and exclaimed, we did this. Warming up and plunging into the 50 degree water and screaming out just as fast. This is the exhibit that resulted from that meeting at the St. John Arts Center in St. Saint, Saint, Saint John, New Brunswick. To sum this project up, I wanted to illustrate fleeting moments of childhood and his nostalgia, nostalgia for older ways of living and juxtapose them against the backdrop of the globalization of the fishing industries, leaving us pondering about the future. Sea change. Sea change contrasts the development of young girls through time with the cyclical and timeless maritime landscape behind them. Each girl is photographed annually, charting her growth. 
the transformation of physicality and posture often causes the viewer to ask, is this the same girl? In 2006, the idea for this project happened spontaneously when I photographed my daughters fearlessly holding a lobster. In 2015, I continued with photographs of Maggie at age 15 and expanded the reach of the project to include 17 girls. These are four of the photographs of Maggie. And then, and this one is her older photographs. Now, Maggie is studying astrophysics and misses home on foggy days in Kingston, Ontario. And when I took this photograph of Maggie with her long hair, it immediately reminded me of a modernized Venus in a clamshell posed against a watery backdrop. The edited body of work contains 65 photographs with two to seven portraits of each girl. With the continuity of the common backdrop, each girl chose her own outfit and the way she held her lobster. Some girls were cautious while some were proud and still others nonchalant. Some cradled, some squirmed, some raised it aloft triumphantly. Photographing the girls over time, I saw the sea change in their lives as they transitioned from girlhood to adolescence to womanhood. The big lobster Natale, uh, no, the big lobster Natalie is holding at age 11, recalls the classic shot of a fisherman holding up his big, big catch. The sense of perspective changes dramatically with the tide. If you look carefully, you notice the tides changing from low to high to mid to high in these photographs. This, the lobster is the symbol of the fishing industry where the girls live. It is no longer food for the poor or sold across town. Now it is shipped globally overnight. Mackenzie, age 11 and 12, won the Beth Block Award at the Houston Center for Photography. Mackenzie's twin sister, Sarah. Over time, the girls come up with their own strategies to deal with the strange creature and the lobster becomes less prominent. Trust immigrated from Uganda to St. George when her father was appointed the minister of a local Anglican church. We were forbidden to enter Canada due to COVID. So you might notice the year gap between the last two photos and many of the series of girls. In Sea Change, I hope to reveal something of each girl's character as she takes stock of a lobster. Delaney's grandparents run a sawmill on the property of their ancestors who received a land grant by the British Crown in 1797. Through this series, I explore identity and femininity. Rachel is Maggie's best friend and granddaughter of Anne, the woman in the fur coat. Recently, Rachel wrote me from London to share her favorite quote by Sylvia Plath. It goes like this. I sometimes think my vision of the sea is the clearest thing I know. Kayla, at age 11, 
was afraid of the lobster. And so her father held it. She did not, she didn't want to be photographed at age 12. Now she works summers in the lobster processing plant, touching hundreds of these crustaceans. When her dad looked at the last photo in the series, his eyes opened wide and he exclaimed, she's a young woman. When did that happen? I am honored that Sea Change will have its premier solo exhibition this summer at Sunbury Shores Art and Nature Center in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, not too far from St. George. So the girls and their families will be able to attend. Thank you everyone for joining me. Annie Omens and Diane Hemingway. It was great to see your work tonight. And thank you, Aline and the LACP and my classmates for your guidance and encouragement. It's been a wonderful journey getting to know you and seeing your work grow. Thank you to my friends and family, and especially to Peter, who believes in me unconditionally. And above all, many thanks to the people of Back Bay and St. George. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. You can unshare your screen. Yeah. Um, and now is the time to throw some questions into the Q&A if you have them. Wow, what a life, Susan. So, I mean, so filled with photography. And um, my first question for you is, do you miss assignment work? Assignment work in some ways is much easier. Somebody t makes a connection for you. They tell you what to do. You go on a little adventure. You ask where the local swimming hole is and you go for swimming somewhere in New England. You always have that bathing suit with you. And you come home and you, you know, at that point I would bring the film to the lab or bring it to the airport and ship it directly to people or any place at Time Life. Um, and you'd process it, you'd look at them, edit it, and ship it out FedEx. And it was just really. There were really fun aspects to it. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to find subjects. Um, and looking at your project about, is it New Brunswick? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's since it's such an insular community, I, I was wondering how they accepted you as an outsider coming in and photographing, you know, all the fishermen and, um, are you like a rock star in the town now? <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people didn't get to see the exhibits, unfortunately, but my friends know who I am. Yeah. And um, it really began photographing the industries by photographing the people that we made friends with and they had kids the same age or, you know, we just, our circles kind of intertwined. It's not a summer community at all. So you get to know the local people and you get to hear the stories and you get to learn about it. Maggie's dad, Warwick, um, helped us quite a few times in the very beginning, like getting a mooring in. And, and as a result, we met him. And then we found out the kids were the same age. And so we would all get together a lot and we would, you go to look at weirs at night to see if the fisher have come into the net. And so he would always talk about the fish and what was happening and what was gonna to happen tonight and what he was hoping for. And that really piqued my interest in the whole project in that aspect of the project. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to sea change um, that in I love work about time and um, I, I'm curious and Jennifer also asked the question, uh, what's next for you and the girls, but I'm also curious as to what the parents think and what the girls think when they see these images. Um, the parents, the parents have to drive their kids over. Kids there don't get a driver's license until they're 18. So 
their parents are bringing them. So the parents are part of the project in that way. Often they sit and, and we visit. Sometimes they even come over at other times and we play games or go on an outing. Um, and um, the girls really look forward to it. They're like, I was wondering if you were calling this summer or during COVID, they were like, I guess Sophie, I guess Susan's not going to be coming this summer. Um, and it's interesting to interview them. A lot of times they talk about their clothing. They talk about how they were scared of the lobster at first, but now, now that they do it, it's so easy um, until the lobster flaps its tail. Um, and they're really excited to, they're, they're excited and hesitant to see the show in um, St. Andrews this summer because they know that their friends are going to also see the photographs. You know, you started off um, that project photographing your own daughters. And then with all projects, there's like a genesis. And then how did you make that leap to begin photographing other girls and using um, that incredible Botticelli uh, Venus figure kind of backdrop? And um, there are some questions on how did you decide on a lobster and um, also on your really choice of flash, which makes things so much more dramatic and, and gives the work a real consistency. So maybe you could talk about your process in creating the project and then all the elements that you thought about going into it, including the lighting and the lobster. Um, so the very be beginning with my daughters, it was that somebody had brought us a lobster to have. Um, and so uh, they, were, they weren't they were scared of them. And I, as a kid, had been kind of scared of snakes. And I, I don't know if I held a lobster when I was a kid or if I would have held a lobster. So I was like, hey, can I take your picture? And the camera I had was a 645, I think it was a Mimia 645, and it had a built-in flash on it. And it was a film camera. And so that's the camera that I used in the very beginning. The flash is not particularly strong, but, and the sun is, is it's backlit if you wanna get the background. So you have to add light and then I photographed family and friends who would come over, like Maggie came over or Cena was there one time. And those pictures are actually in the series. Um, and then some friends saw it and they said, you should really do this as a project. It'd be really great. And my kids were finally away at school or, you know, they were old enough to stay home and, and, wherever they were in the States. And so we were up there alone and I decided to reach out to other girls. And one woman brought over five girls with her and, you know, the van door opened and out came five girls. And at first the flash I was using was a handheld, like a little flash that you put on the Nikon and it didn't, it wasn't powerful enough. And so then I had to buy some lights so there was definitely, and then as I started printing it, I realized that one light wasn't enough. And I kept adding a little bit more light each summer to make it so that they'd be easier to print. So there wouldn't be deep shadows. Um, and the other thing is shooting it in film was great, but there's no place to buy film there. There's no place to process film there. And I felt like I really needed to see the results as I went along. Um, so what camera are you using now? Now I'm using the Nikon Z7. Um, were you aware? You asked, go ahead. You asked about the lobster too, why a yeah. lobster? Uh -huh. that's, 
that's kind of why the lobster was there. So that's why the lobster, but the lobster also is very representative of the community, which uh, when it's a really long time ago, when the tide went out, there would be lobsters on the ocean floor sitting there in the low, in the low tide that wouldn't make it to the next tide. So they became, if you got them early, they were food. And if not, they became fertilizer. And now it's become each year, the lobsters are more and more expensive. I'm wondering if you had any sense of Nicholas Nixon's, uh, the Brown sisters. So you kind of had that wonderful look at time and how people grow and change. And, and with your work in particular, you know, the child changes so tremendously, much more than um, the Brown sisters did because they were already adults. Um, just wondering if you had an awareness of that work. I did have an awareness about that work and um, which I think it's an incredible body of work. It's incredible. And I was also aware of, Rhine I say Reinecke digestra, but I've heard that it's pronounced differently, but I don't know the yeah. correct pronunciation, but her beach portraits as well. Um, I did photographs like the beach portraits a really long time ago um, with flash, but they never amounted to something. So I don't, you know, it's not, it wasn't like either of their projects actually came to me. It really started because I was photographing my own children every year. And so that that's how it came about was thinking about my own kids. Yeah. Um, Marcy Duran asks you, um, it's wonderful to have watched sea change unfold as young girls and adolescents are all, all often very self-conscious about their image. How did that change with your interaction with them over the years? Were they more comfortable with you as time went on? I think that over the period of time, it changes that I don't think it's linear. I think that one thing that seems linear is that they hold the lobster differently as they get older. Mm -hmm. um, but I do find it interesting that there's a picture of Maggie, I think she's 20, and Cena's, Cena might be also 20, where both of them have on dresses. And there's something very similar about those two photographs. And I don't know why, it just really strikes me. Um, and the girls are, they're all self-conscious in their own way, some more than others. Um, they're familiar with me, but they're still aware that I'm taking their photograph. Um, Yvette asks, can you speak to how you came up with the new name? Because this was originally called the Lobster Girls and how you landed with that new name. The original name was actually Crustaceans and then it became the Lobster Girls and it came, became sea change about a month ago. Um, the reason that it changed was I had portfolio reviews and someone said to me that they didn't like the title and I respected who she was and what her thought process and decided that I had to respect that. And sea change means a fundamental monumental change. And that's what's happening in these girls. There's this monumental change. And so it's, um, it's a concept, it's an idiom and it seemed really appropriate. And when I asked everybody in my masterclass, they all went, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, final question. Uh, Lisa asked, will you have the chance to ask your subjects who are able to attend the showing and who are now older, what they think of their younger selves captured in the series? Um, last summer, I did a few interviews. Um, I, I, 
it, there's an art to interviewing. So I was a little rocky in them, but I've got some some good ideas from them of things that they said. I haven't figured out how that might fit in to the exhibit that I have this summer. I'm I'm not sure yet. Well, and thank I think you. The, Go ahead. the last question I think is, am I going to still continue to take pictures? Yes. Um, and Part of me goes, I'm, I'm finished and yet I'm looking at these kids and especially the younger kids. I'm thinking that I definitely want to photograph at least the younger kids this summer and maybe onward. I think this is a lifelong project. And even if you make the work you have now into a book, you can have part two. <laughs> I think you should keep going because it's so fascinating. Um, just to see how we evolve and grow. So Susan, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank and you, Aline. You are welcome. And now our final uh, presenter of the evening, the wonderful Annie Omens. Um, Annie Omens is a photographic and mixed media artist. And uh, I have to say that Annie is fearless in her um, using of all kinds of materials, and it's just great, who explores the natural world with a conscious perception of what is hidden, what is known, and how nature impacts the human psyche. Informed by her interest in shamanism and Celtic lore, Omens uses photomontage to examine the intersection of the real and the dimensional death depth of the unseen, mixing modalities and meanings with what is perceived and what might be. Omen's education includes studies in photography and art at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, the Savannah College of Art and Design, the Marquette University and Mount San Jacinto College in Menifee, California. Omens has exhibited nationally and internationally, including at exhibitions at the San Diego Art Institute, Pennsylvania Center for Photography, the Herbert Turner Gallery, and the Oceanside Museum of Art, amongst others. She has received numerous awards for her work, and she lives in San Diego and Mexico. Welcome, Annie. Thank you, Eileen. It's been a pleasure to be with everyone. Um, and hello to everyone that's with us tonight. Thank you for coming. I wish I could see your faces, but I know you're out there. Um, and I do appreciate the Los Angeles Center of Photography for hosting us. This series is really important to us, and we appreciate you giving us the opportunity to share our work. Aline, thank you for mentoring our group. It's been such a wonderful process. Um, with your support, your guidance, um, and also thanks to my compadres on this journey for your kindness and inspiration. My name is Annie Omens. I'm a photographer and mixed media artist who explores the natural world to find what can be revealed beyond our ordinary perception. I grew up in the Midwest in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. These are my parents. My mother, a very creative woman who believed in fairies and angels and who profoundly influenced me. She loved the forest and bird watching and taught me how to have a connection to nature among the trees. This set me up to see the world as a mystical and magical place. I continue to carry this sense of wonder with me, and it has informed my current landscapes that are part of memory as a verb. This is my father. He was a proud man with strong values. As a child of Finnish immigrants, he worked hard to provide for his family as a salesman, an antique dealer, and a junk collector. When I was young, our family moved throughout the Midwest, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, following my father's jobs in sales. 
This is a family picture of me and my brother and sister with my cousins. We're all dressed up in our Easter Sunday best in Cleveland, Ohio, where I spent most of my formative years. When I graduated high school, I went off to college to Milwaukee, Wisconsin during the early 70s. It was a turbulent and rich culture of unrest and change, and the music of the times was central to my life. I almost made it to Woodstock, and so did Joni Mitchell. Here is a poster that I had of Joni, and I remember naming her as the person that I most wanted to spend time with on my art school application. I couldn't think of anything better than designing album covers at the time, but it wasn't until quite recently that I got to do just that for two musicians. Sandy Kimmel, who is a singer and songwriter, and Daryl Sturmer, who is the lead guitarist for Phil Collins and Genesis. In Milwaukee, I started out at Marquette University. And after a year, satisfying the deal I made with my parents that I would at least start out at a liberal arts college and not art school, I transferred to what is now known as the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, where I studied different disciplines, mainly drawing and sculpture. It wasn't until I transferred to the Savannah College of Art two years later that I fell in love with photography. I was lucky enough to land a work study job in the photo lab, which gave me extra time in the darkroom. Our wonderful teacher, Fred Ensley, introduced us to many alternative processes, such as gum bichromate, cyanotype, and pinhole cameras, as you can see in our cyanotype class portrait, holding our pinhole cameras. And this was in front of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. You can see me as the dorky one on the far right. As a final project, I created a book that explored the use of Xerox prints as self-portraits and combined them with my 35 millimeter black and white images. When my family's college fund for me ran out, I had to quit art school. I was left with no clear way to support myself with my fine art education. Since I loved to travel, I was fortunate to get a job as a flight attendant with a major airline. And I was based in New York City, San Francisco, and finally San Diego. After flying for five years, I met my husband and continued to fly for another five years. We had many opportunities to travel all over the world, and I always took my camera with me. I lent my camera to my husband for this one. When we decided to start our family, I quit my airline job and dedicated myself to my two beautiful daughters, teaching art for years in each of their classrooms, and also being involved in their lives and school activities, like Caveman Day. <laughs> We lived in a small rural town in Southern California when we had, where we had an assortment of animals that included horses, miniature donkeys, dogs, and cats. This was our Christmas card one year, minus the chinchilla. I've always had a connection to horses. My love for horses and riding eventually led me to train, compete, and win a year-end jumping championship in San Diego County. It wasn't all fun and games though. Ask my chiropractor. At least this was a softer landing. 
Here is my wonderful hunter jumper toward the end of his days. He carried me not only through the show ring, but through the mountain trails where we would go camping together. As a stay at home mom, I continued to take art workshops to hone my artistic skills and to keep on track as an artist. In particular, I studied with photographers who used paint and mixed media with their images. I enjoyed learning from artists such as Kate Brakey, Holly Roberts, and Aline Smithson. When my aging mother slipped into dementia, my brother generously offered to have my parents leave Los Angeles and come live with him in a small town in Kansas. This is my brother standing in my father's antique and junk shop that my dad purchased after he moved to Kansas. He found a sprawling building with several rooms to house his collections, which at this point was more junk than antiques. It was in disrepair. Behind this bright white garage door was this. And behind the shop's storefront windows was my dad and his stuff. Everything had value to him. Perhaps coming from the time of the depression, he learned to treasure everything. When both of our parents passed away, my brother, my sister, and myself had to go through rooms of accumulated stuff, not only of objects recognized by us from our childhood, but a cosmos of other people's possessions. We unearthed belongings from our past, like my brother's baseball glove, stuffed animals that once sat on our beds, toys, bowls from the kitchen, and the watercolor rooster my mom had painted and proudly placed over the living room couch where it hung for years. My dad had often boasted about the hidden and valuable gems he had, so it forced us to comb through every dust-covered object piece by piece, searching for something valuable or worth keeping. We did find treasures like the antique iron toys, but it was hard to find them mixed in with everything else. The task was daunting. I documented our progress to help process the overwhelm we felt trying to put the experience, like the antiques we sorted through, into a neat package to take stock somehow before of all of his belongings scattered into auctions, the Goodwill store, and the dumpster. In our memory as a verb group, we often had discussions about treasured objects holding memories despite them being transitory and impermanent. In the end, the permanence of my father's beloved collections is only retained through these photographs. I have always been a spiritual seeker, and one of my paths was studying Peruvian shamanism with the Four Wind Society. Here is Don Francisco, one of my Peruvian teachers, blowing a prayer to the heavens with his breath. This is my shadow mapping series that came from this work. Charting dreams, visioning, and working through the shadow aspects of myself toward the purpose of finding freedom from past entanglements, both personal and ancestral. I created them by photographing my shadow and then layering through photo montage, personally symbolic images. I also used this technique to respond to the cultural and political landscape of the Me Too movement and women's empowerment. I call this one stop. And this is born to be wild, the geometry of birth. For many years, I have been fortunate to spend time in the Sonoran Desert in Baja, Mexico, near the Sea of Cortez. For me, this is a very special place of serene beauty 
where time is ancient and there is a feeling that something magical could be right around the next corner or cactus as the case may be. There is unparalleled natural beauty with the water, the whales, and the sand dunes. The scale of the landscape is amazing as in this photo where the distant figures are my daughter and my husband. The abandoned buildings that dot the landscape are equally beautiful, but poignant and gritty. It is haunting to witness these abandoned dreams as moments in time that continue to be transformed from vandalism and the natural elements. These are two diptychs from my abandoned series. I've also combined the abandoned buildings with the desert landscapes into a series I call Space Time, reflecting the transitory time we humans live on Earth, juxtaposed to the seeming timelessness of nature. And this brings me to the series I created for Memory as a Verb, Transcending the Temporal. And I'd like to start out with a quote from John Muir. The clearest way into the universe is through a forest of wilderness. When the pandemic hit, I canceled my yearly time in Mexico. During the lockdown, I sought the kinship and stability of the trees in the forest. Exploring a connection with nature was an antidote for the loss of connection I felt with society. The rapid change in the world of what had seemed more or less permanent left me feeling off-center, disconnected, and unbalanced. Using photo montage, I laid together two or more of my straight captures to create an ethereal sense of the ordinary dissolving boundaries and revealing a mystical connection and a grounding to something more permanent. In this series, it was important for me to interface with something that transcended the temporal world. The forest speaks to my soul of a kind of essential permanence. Memory is tangibly ingrained in the layers of trunks and the bark of trees yet there is a mystical quality that points to more. My aim is to capture this rarefied quality of lightness and connection to something larger. In a world that can feel heavy with loss and uncertainty, my wish for you is that you can connect with this sublime dimension of permanence through a tree, a river, or the sky. Thank you for letting me share my personal story, my work, and my imaginings with you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, all right, now's the time for your questions. Um, I, I, I wanna go back to that series with the shadow, which I don't remember the title of. Um, shadow mapping. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are like such dynamic uh, images. How did you, you know, what was the genesis of that? Well, um, we used to live in the country when you saw all those animals um, and we had um, a wall that was perfectly lined up to the sunset every night. And I would see my shadow and I have shadows of the dogs and everything else. And I would just photograph those shadows. Um, I've always loved shadows since I was a kid. And we used to follow my shadow on the street um, or the shadow would follow me. But um, I, I just, I had a collection of shadows. I put things out there. I put tables and chairs and plants and, and uh, I was just kind of crazy with all the shadows. So then when I started my work with the four winds, you know, the word shadow was apparent in all of our work because that's what we were working with, our own personal shadows. So I just started, you know, a lot of times my images just kind of create themselves and I just would pull one shadow and, you know, I, I have a library in Lightroom and I just, 
have libraries of images like, you know, um, trees and flowers and, you know, I've just got it all um, organized. And so I would just say, well, this shadow needs of this or that. And I just start pulling them in um, in Photoshop and putting them together to represent what I was feeling. And they kind of create themselves actually. Wow. I don't take credit for them. I mean, they just kind of happen once I start pulling things together. So Dina asked, do you imagine the montage images as you shoot them or do they come together after reviewing your pictures? You know, I think everything for me comes together after. I, um, like I was saying, I, I catalog all of my images and then I sit down um, with an idea, but then I just, I'll put them, you know, in a grid and I'll just say, oh, this one belongs with this and that one belongs with this. And then I just start layering them. Um, I can kind of, um, you know, I'm just looking at compositions and what's going to fit where and, and that kind of thing with those, um, tree montages yeah um Anne marie asked did your project come from the the workshop or did it start before and it is so beautiful she says thank you um it actually came from the workshop um because we were in covid um in the beginning it was still lockdown wasn't it yeah uh, and so, um, you know, we didn't, I didn't get to go to Mexico. So um, I went into my cat, my catalog and, and I just really, the trees and nature were just such a solace to me during that time. I, like I say, I just felt so disconnected from society. So um, I wanted to create these images that held me in their arms really. Um, so it came during the work. This is a whole new body of work that I created during the workshop. Yeah, it's interesting that the workshop had projects that were fully fleshed out and there were people making new work. So it was like kind of all over the place. Um, I, you know, Susan, I don't know how many, maybe you made some new photos last year, but a lot of the workshop was really the articulation and growing as an artist and thinking about being an artist and those kinds of things. Um, but I don't want to take this away from you. Um, well, it was interesting because when I signed up for the class, I had an idea that I wanted to do something else that I ended up doing. I mean, I was going to complete other projects and then this one just sort of sprung forth um, because of COVID, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lisa asks, um, she said, I really enjoyed the imagery with the snake symbolism. Snakes often symbolize knowledge and healing. How did you choose the snake symbol? And do you plan to add any more work to that series? Yes, I always think I'm going to, but I haven't yet. Um, I always search for good um, walls <laughs> that have good shadows because I don't live in that place anymore. Um, and during the shamanism, the shamans believe that um, that the snake is a feminine um, image and that it is power. And when I did live in that house, um, those, I have a quick story. Um, I, there was a huge rattlesnake in my driveway and I went and got my camera and I was, my knees were shaking. And um, I heard the snake say to me, you know, internally, don't be afraid of power. And, and then I was kind of, wow. And it said, not only power outside of yourself, but power inside of yourself. So um, that kind of started me in thinking of snakes as positive alongside thinking of it as, as, as um, feminine energy and also the Kundalini. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but um, I've been to India and studied, you know, Hinduism and such. And so, that's also a symbol. So in the in the West, it's kind of gotten a bad rap, the snake and serpent, but I kind of go the other way and, and appreciate this, the powerful symbol that it is. Um, Yvette asked, um, can you tell us more about the process you used in taking your photographs? They are magnificent. Oh, thank you. So, in a particular series or um, 
I'm assuming the last series. The, tree, the trees. Yeah. Um, you know, I've just always had this connection with trees. So I have a whole catalog in Lightroom of trees. And so when I started to put the, the photo montages together, I would just go through my trees and um, it's hard to explain my process because it's so unconscious really. Um, like I say, I look at grids and decide which ones go together just intuitively and then pull them into, into Photoshop and start layering in. And I also um, erase parts of the images. You know, I, I don't just lay them on top. And um, so I don't know exactly how to explain it other than that. But Yeah, you are the creator. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Amy says such beautiful work, Annie. Thank you. When you um, go back to your archive, what surprises you the most? Um, the archive of all Just my work. I think your general archive, because you said you had an archive of images. Oh, well, you know what? To be honest, how much I've improved. You know, like photos that I took a long time ago and put them in as special photos. Now I look at it and go, why did I save that? So I feel like as time goes on, you just get to be, you have more mastery over, um, you know, the photography and your eye is, you know, more astute and um, it just uh, um, surprises me. I think the other thing that I do is I keep photographing the same subjects like shadows and trees and snakes and nature. I love to go out in nature like Diane does and just get lost in it and see what comes up. Yeah. Um, Rosalie asks, your mother's belief in fairies and mysticism clearly influenced you in such a beautiful way. I'm curious if these beliefs were ever difficult for you as a child. Hmm. You know, um, no, <laughs> not at all. I think <laughs> the people who, um, who believe that themselves and their parents tell them, no, you're crazy. I think those are the people that really suffer. My mom gave us permission to, I mean, okay, here's a story. We had a fairy living in our kitchen and she would say, oh, did you see it? It just ran under the counter. So, you know, we lived with someone who had a wild imagination and supported us in ours. So no, it was, that was a real positive part of my childhood. Well, that's just like, we need fairies right now. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to like say it out loud. Um, um, so, well, thank you all so much. This has been such a special evening and incredibly bittersweet for me because this is our, our last round of talks. But um I do want to say to any of the memory as a verb artists that are out in the audience, please check your email. And um, I want to thank uh, Diane and Susan and Annie for brilliantly sharing their work and their lives and inspiring us this evening. And um, so here's, here's a toast to all of you. So happy to drink. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>